here. I came all the way from Rabat to uh, this beautiful state of Virginia to visit you and uh, not on the invitation of my friends and colleagues from uh, the, the Department of Missile Department and also uh, Gender and Women Studies. And uh, I really thank them all, Charlotte and Farzane, Denise, everyone, to have really uh, invited me and for hosting me today. Um, very um, inspired today because uh, the talk addresses really major essential uh, topics uh, for our societies and for our world. And I'm thrilled also to, to be able to speak also about this country, Morocco, to tell you more about it and really um, help those who are already engaged in learning things about Morocco and facts about Morocco to um, you know, deepen their knowledge. Um, so women in Morocco always good start to start with facts and numbers. Uh, Morocco has a very interesting recent history in uh, of success stories in terms of women's rights and women empowerment in business and in politics, for a start. Uh, let, I'm giving you here examples. Women and men have equal rights in Morocco as far as politics and business are concerned. That's a very important point. Uh, in business and in politics, rights between men and women in Morocco are equal. Uh, it's not the case in other matters that we will see later on. The Moroccan parliament as of today has 81 women over 395 people. So it's barely 20% of women, women presence in the, par the parliament as of today. The current Moroccan government has currently nine women. And the elected president of the representatives of Moroccan businesses, uh, business owners, is a woman. And it's, she's elected, so it's not an appointment. So that, that speaks also uh, for, so that another, this is a symbolic uh, fact that I enjoy sharing every time. Uh, it's this historical symbol of the first university in the world, still operating today, was created actually by two women, by Fatima Al-Piri and her sister Maryam, uh, back in the year, uh, you know, in the 8th century, 9th century. And uh, they, they were two Muslim Moroccan ladies who created the first university in the world, still, still operating today. It's based in Fez, in Morocco, and it's a Qawiyin university. So, um, just uh, again, uh, in a nutshell, Islam is the religion of the state in Morocco, as per the constitution, and the king is the spiritual or a spiritual and religious leader but also he is, of course, the head of the state. And uh, currently, that's another interesting fact, it's the, the conservative party, or the so-called Islamist party in, in Morocco, has been actively participating in the political life in Morocco, in the government and in the parliament for the past uh, decade. Morocco is, and many of you know that probably, uh, is and ha has been an open, welcoming country, geographically located in really a strategic position at the crossroads of between Africa, Europe, and the Middle East. So the key, the key ideas I'm addressing today is that actually the role of women, and more specifically the role of the feminist movements in Morocco as a tool of transformation of the laws in the country in favor of women. The feminist movement in Morocco had a significant impact on the reforms um, of the family code. Yeah? Uh, I'm not using it actually. We're using only that. So, um, the feminist movement in Morocco had a significant impact on the reforms of the family code in Morocco, among other legal texts. We will see that in a, in, a, in a bit. So other key ideas I'm addressing to you today. The, the feminist movements in Morocco also impacted with their sustained activism, the democratic changes which occurred uh, in the country, uh, the, what we call democratic transition 
of Morocco in the 90s and the years 2000. What is at stake is to invent in Morocco really an innovative, a new model, uh, equitable, uh, balanced and viable model for the Moroccan society. The Moroccan society has important expectations, of course, and uh, the balance also between tradition and the urge to modernity as well, taking into consideration the diversity of the components of this society. So uh, some, some uh, dates, historical contests, so you know the independence, etc. I mean, I, I think it's important to, to address that quickly. There was the, Morocco was under the French protectorate between 1912 and 1956. Morocco was under the French protectorate. And uh, in, in 1956, Morocco is an independent country uh, headed by King Mohammed V, the grandfather of the current king. In 1961, King Hassan II ascends the Moroccan throne after King Mohammed V passed. And um, in July 1999, uh, current King Mohammed VI ascends the throne after King Hassan II passed in 1999. Um, some legal reform we need to, to be aware of, very important ones, and one of them is really, uh, is, uh, is uh, actually regarding the family code. Uh, the first family code in, in independent Morocco was actually enacted in 1958. In 1993, there was really the very first and very minor also reform of the family code that we call Mudawana. Mudawana basically means code in Arabic. It's actually a corpus text. Uh, 2004, there was really a major reform of the family code in Morocco. And we'll see uh, in the next slides later on what were the, what was the, 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 the subject uh, of, the, of, of the reform of 2004. Another, and in those years, if you can notice here, the early uh, 2000, I mean, the years 2000, many reform to, uh, reforms took place right after uh, King Mohammed VI ascended to the throne in 1999. So that was the first decade of, of, of his, um, of his uh, presence as a king were clearly very impactful, very significant. Another reform was the reform on the nationality code in 2004, which allowed for the first time uh, Moroccan women to give the Moroccan citizenship to their children when the father is not Moroccan. It was not the case before. It was not the case. Um, 2003, so you can see the same, the same decade, reform of the code of commerce, allowing women to run their own businesses without the prior authorization of their husband. Before 2003, this did not, did not exist. So that's really major, even symbolically. 2003, the reform of the Code of Commerce. Yeah, this, sorry, it comes twice, fine. Yes, this is the, the, these are the latest ones that are really worth mentioning. August uh, 2017, the new law creating the authority for parity and the struggle against all, form, all, all forms of discrimination in Morocco. The role of such authorities to encourage in Morocco the establishment of a culture of uh, equality, of parity, and of non-discrimination, including in educational programs, including um, involving the control and the follow-up of all forms all forms of discrimination towards women. So it's new, it's starting to operate. Let's see what, how efficient this authority will uh, turn out to be. That's also a major law. Very recent, February 2018, so it's a few uh, weeks ago, the new law in Morocco on violence against women. That is major, and I give in here just a few facts about violence against women in Morocco, because I am mentioning this very new law. I think it's worth to, to hear some numbers. In Morocco, just like in many other countries, you know violence is 
an issue, a serious issue in so many countries, not only in the Islamic world, it's in every country nowadays, even in Europe and uh, in the US, I know that the problems are also diverse and real in terms of violence. So in Morocco, women suffer from precarity. So that's one thing, economics, it's an economic issue and several forms of violence. Eight women out of 10 don't have any access to income, formal or informal, it's a lot, versus three out of 10 men. These are numbers, official numbers from the HCP, which is actually the high commissioner for, for planning and for statistics in Morocco. It is even worse in rural areas where nearly nine women out of 10 have no income, no, not a formal income or informal. Uh, versus two out of ten for men in rural areas. And regarding gender-based violence, this uh, the, the HCP numbers from a survey which was made in to, back in 2009 tell us that 62.8 million of Moroccan women have been um, uh, percent sorry million, have been victims of violence in all its forms the year of the survey. According to the study, there was a study made in Morocco called Masculinities and Gender Equality. Uh, it was made in 2016, so it's quite recent in Morocco, in the region of Rabat, Salek, and Ikra. So it's really in one region in Morocco. With the support of UN women, nearly 40% of Moroccan men think that women deserve to be beaten. Uh, few facts about violence again. Moreover, the study showed that violence is normalized in the mind of men and women as nearly 60% of men and almost half of the interviewed women <coughs> believe that a woman should tolerate, tolerate violence to keep the family and the household united. Therefore, one of the biggest challenges to fight violence is the change of mentalities, which implies to raise awareness among boys and girls to make them subscribe to the principle of equality so they can start promoting it. So the rise of feminists in Morocco, so that we go back to the main um, aspect of the talk. Upon the arrival of King Hassan II to the Moroccan throne in 61, Morocco went through a difficult political transition in the 60s. Moroccan citizens, including former nationalists with activist resistance, as we call under occupation usually, became aware of the fact that democratic institutions were not yet fully implemented in the country. Uh, as a result, communist and socialist, I mean, leftist movements emerged as the political opposition in the country, leading the contestations against the regime run by intellectuals, scholars, uh, labor unions as well. So Moroccan female intellectuals in, in this particular um, context, leftists mostly, started forming their own women's associations, such as the Union, Union Progressiste des Femmes Marocaines and the Union Nationale des Femmes Marocaines. These are really major NGOs in Morocco. So their creation was really a leftist, it was influenced by leftist leftist ideas. In addition, these feminists started joining the leftist political parties, the Progress and Socialism Party, um, and the Socialist Union of the Popular Front. These are political parties in Morocco from the leftist uh, ideology. Uh, so a liberal secular movement of contestation, this is what it was. The ideology of the socialist or leftist Feminists was mainly secular, very liberal, focusing on promoting gender equality and achieving a clear separation between religion, tradition, and society. The feminist movement thus became highly politicized and associated with the leftist political opposition in Morocco. The weak point of such situation was one, Women's rights were only one aspect of the political agenda of these leftist parties. And second, they obviously were not the priority of the political establishment in power. 
democratic change and broader feminism in the 80s. So what happens in the 80s? From the independence of Morocco until the early 80s, we can say that feminist movements were roughly highly elitist, mainly intellectuals, scholars, it's the elite, and highly connected to politics. As a result, there was little connection between these elites and the Moroccans in rural areas or, or the illiterate Moroccans, and illiteracy in, in Morocco is a serious issue, who represent the majority in the country. In addition, the democratic shift in Morocco allowed an alternative feminist movement in the country to thrive, what we call social feminism. And we will see what it's about, you can, you can imagine. It's the rise of civil society and social feminism in Morocco, mid 80s, end of 80s, and maybe 90s. Social feminism appeared in the mid 80s and mostly the 90s as the political regime in power made an effort to allow more freedom of expression among the people and implemented the first significant democratic moves in Morocco under King Hassan II. Therefore, the scope of individual and civil liberties was broadened. That's very important because it's in, it impacts really the, the, the feminist uh, movements and the activism in Morocco allowing the formation of a civil society in Morocco and social activism through NGOs. Consequently, the newly formed women's rights NGOs, including the Islamist NGOs, were more active with uneducated, uh, rural, vulnerable women, offering them awareness on empowerment, <coughs> on their rights, on financial autonomy, education, self-entrepreneurship, etc. So feminist associations gained autonomy and were not necessarily linked to political parties. This distance from political parties was a key factor in the qualitative transformation of the Moroccan feminist movements. Indeed, women activists became more focused on legal reforms than on their political affiliations. That's important as well. So uh, an interesting fact, I think uh, I always, I mean, I care about uh, pointing out uh, this, this context in Morocco, the polarization of the Moroccan feminism. And it, it is a polarized society as well, actually. So March 12th, to the year 2000, a demonstration of solidarity was organized in Rabat, involving more than 100,000 women's rights liberal activists human rights activists, political party members, and ministers, etc., advocating a deep reform of the family code. Because as you, if you remember the date I gave earlier, uh, the first family code was uh, voted uh, in 1958, and it was one, one reform only took place, and it was a minor one in 1993. So a few weeks later, a large Islamist demonstration, more conservative, therefore, was organized in Casablanca to denounce the pro-Western, so-called pro-Western, values and non-compliance uh, aspect of the reforms that were defended by liberal feminists, saying you're asking for too much, you're going way too far, etc. Which is actually, I mean, there is a debate in, within the society. How to compromise in a polarized society? Since the early uh, years 2000, we can easily notice that Moroccan politics and the Moroccan civil society are actually polarized, making it difficult for the government, uh, for the government to find a viable compromise of legal reform regarding women. So it, it, made, it made things really complicated. In the early years of um, the years 2000, King Mohammed VI appointed a commission, a pluridisciplinary commission actually, it was a major commission um, that was appointed at that time by the king, composed of a diverse group of actors, religious scholars, researchers, women's rights activists, lawyers, um, sociologists, etc. From really every, they were representing society within this commission in order to discuss 
and draft an ambitious, innovative family code that confirms at the same time with the religion of the state. So that was that took three years because it's really it was really a very, very thorough, very important work and lots of debates within this commission before giving uh, birth to this a reform of the family code. So the family code was voted uh, in the fall of 2003, early 2004. And uh, the major amendments to the, to the family code were actually equality between husband and wife within the family, within the household. That's very new because they introduced the principle of co-responsibility, a word that was never used before because in the former Mudawana uh, or family code, the, the household was placed under the sole leadership of the husbands. So that's quite important to say, not anymore under, placed under the sole uh, authority of the husband, but it's a co-responsibility. Both husbands and wives are responsible of the household. So the household, as I said, is not, no longer pla placed under the leadership of the husband. The Quranic notion of women's obedience, or ta, to the husband is abandoned. Marital, marital tutelage removal. In the former Mudawana, um, an adult person, adult, an adult woman, could not uh, marry without the, permission, the, the prior permission of her guardian. And she's an adult. We're talking about an adult woman in Morocco before 2004 to get married. So the father, who's the guardian normally, uh, needed to give her permission. So without his permission, she could not get married. And this was removed in, in the new, uh, in the reform of 2004. All adult women now can get married <coughs> without the permission, the, the prior permission of their guardian. And they can sign their marriage contract. Before, they, you needed the, the co-signature, two signatures on the contract of, of, of ma the marriage contract. So that's major also. The age of marriage changed for women, actually. The age of marriage for women increases from 15, before it was 15, to 18 years old. So it's the same as boys, actually. So now it's 18 years old. At 18 years old, we can get, everyone can get married. Under that age, they need, and we'll talk about the mar marriages of minors of age, we need the authorization of a judge uh, according to a whole procedure. Polygamy. Polygamy is not banned in Morocco. It's not the case in Tunisia, where it's banned for a long time. But in Morocco, it's not banned. But it became, since 2004, strictly controlled and, and by, by it's actually placed under the authority of the judge. And um, it's the judge that who can authorize a man to um, get married to a, second, uh, to a second woman. Women may insert, however, uh, in a clause in their marriage contract preventing the husband from taking additional wives. Many, many people don't know that, even in Morocco. And we'll talk later about not being aware of your rights and raising awareness on uh, the rights that, that we have as Moroccans. That's very important. So divorce, what happened in divorce? Well, very important change also, the proceedings can be freely initiated by women. Previously, they could only be initiated under some specific reasons by women, while they could always be initiated by men under absolutely uh, no condition. The proceedings are now subject to the judge supervision. So the, the divorce, the numbers, I, I don't have them here, but the number of divorce since 2004 went, um, it is increasing by the day, it's, uh, so that's that's the consequence because women now can ask for a divorce, go to the judge and ask for the divorce and obtain it. Other legal outcomes of Moroccan feminism and activism of women in general in Morocco. In 1993, there was actually you know CEDAW, that's in the, these international uh, conventions and treaties. Uh, Morocco ratified it in 1993. But 
kept reservations on several uh, aspects of the CEDAW. These reservations have been withdrawn in 2008, so a long time after the first signature in 93, by the Moroccan government. Such achievement happened thanks to the constant lobbying of feminist movements and also to the proactive support of the king, uh, who's uh, really uh, very um, <coughs> cares a lot about women's rights in Morocco. Other legal outcomes says that that's, I think that's an important one, although it's not family code, it's criminal code, but you know, the change in happened in 2014. The Moroccan, the Moroccan parliament <coughs> adopted um, a draft, a, a new law to amend an article of the criminal code, which actually allowed rapists to escape prosecution if they married their victim. This article has mainly been used to justify the traditional practice of pressuring the victim to marry her rapist in the name of preserving the honor of the girl's family. This and of the girl, supposedly. This new amendment removes the second paragraph of the article 5475, <coughs> lifting the immunity of the rapist and preventing him from marrying his victim. And the constitution reform of 2011, it was in the, the year of the so-called Arab Springs. Uh, Morocco had some, I mean, that year, I mean, the, the, same, the same period as Tunisia and all the so-called Arab Springs, many demonstrations happened in Morocco as well. And uh, in July of that same year, actually, uh, the new constitution was voted and uh, it really <coughs> brought new changes and major changes as well. So the transver it was a transversal reform of the constitutional text in Morocco, granting for the first time as constitutional principles to all citizens, gender equality in rights and in prerogatives, gender equity, not the terms, I mean, the, 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 the use of these terms is, is new in the constitution, non-discrimination as well, between men and women in Morocco, and the guarantee to all citizens of all of their human rights. So all these, the wording is really uh, an innovation in the constitution. Pending challenges, these are, uh, let's be aware of the challenges, that's important. I mean, it's good to be, to congratulate oneself or a country or, you know, a legal system about the efforts that are made and all the reforms which are really major, which took place, but let's face also the challenges. The law enforcement is one of the major challenges. Difficulty to implement the legal reforms of the family code because there are Moroccans in remote areas, for instance, or illiterate Moroccans, who are still not aware that they have been enacted, they heard, but they don't know, actually, bringing them new rights and new prerogatives. That's one, one uh, situation that is real. Men still force their wives to obey them. The, 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 the patriarchal mentality is still, of course, on. Okay, let's, let's be uh, you know, realistic as well. Um, and the wife do not object at times, either because they are not aware of their rights, as I said, or to avoid um, the, 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 the conf conflict in the household. This is especially the case in rural areas where many people are still illiterate. Law enforcement, the judges are major players, of course, in law enforcement. And uh, we have, I mean, numbers are speaking for themselves. The judges allow too often in rural areas mostly the marriage of minor girls uh, including under the age of 16. So that the debate is taking place now actually about changing this um, to, to put a limit, you know, uh, in, to, to the exception. While the spirit of the family code addresses this as an, uh, only in exceptional, exceptional situations. Also, judges allow too often men to marry a second uh, woman while the 2004 family code, the new, the new family code, is clear about the exceptional character of this option. 
and very clear also about the conditions for the judge to evaluate the request of the husband uh, who wants to marry a second wife. Uh, make sure that he will grant because we need to, the judge needs to really make sure that uh, this man can, is able to grant equal treatment to both families. It's not about a, a, a wife or a woman only, it's about households. It's, it, we're talking about families here and children before giving his authorization to the husband. Mentality is resistant, uh, resistance is clearly a challenge, always, always a challenge, not only the law enforcement, but also the mentalities. Progressive laws develop in Morocco, as I said, in other, and, and in other Muslim countries around the MENA region. But as far as family structure and women's rights are concerned, mindsets and mentalities are generally still resistant, mostly on the ground of patriarchal attitudes, but also on, based on some distorted religious arguments. Within society taken globally, mentalities toward women remain discriminatory and unequal. Behaviors in rural areas become for themselves, behaviors among illiterate populations, etc. So I give you the example, and I'm sure this is not typical to, or specific to Morocco. Um, the practices in the education of boys and girls in homes, I mean, you know, I'm, I know it's happening <coughs> quite everywhere. Uh, they are differentiated. Since their young age, boys learn to be strong, to be, you know, a character, to have authority, etc. And they also learn at a young age that they have power over girls, they're stronger. Girls learn at a young age to act like the perfect mother and wife, the perfect girl, well behaved gifted in the tasks of the house and devoted to her family. This pattern is, is not a myth. It exists in our societies. And despite, despite the excessive motivation <coughs> of these girls later on, a few, a few years later, many women find themselves confined in traditional roles, confined in you know, the role of the mother, the role of the spouse, uh, the guardian of the values of the society, etc. Disadvantaging there are other roles as, I don't know, scholars or professionals or you know, citizens or per, just as a person. So this, the differentiated expectations according to gender continue throughout uh, the socialization later on in the family, but also in the, uh, at work, on the street, at school, everywhere. So this leads often to discrimination, to uh, discomfort, inequalities, violence, and a lot of suffering. So, keeping up with the reform, clearly the trend of the reforms needs absolutely to, to, to be, to keep, you know, uh, to be uh, ongoing. Uh, that's major, and, uh, you know, uh, I'm a lawyer, clearly lawyers care about laws, okay, that's quite a simplistic fact, but everyone cares about laws. At the end of the day, the law is there to protect you. So we need to continue to adopt courageous laws, you know, innovative laws, which are compliant with the constitutional principle of, from the Constitution of 2011, Article 19, which is actually addressing the gen gender equality. So we need to make uh, this uh, principle, which is a principle from the Constitution, we need to make it a reality uh, on the field to revise all the discriminatory measures in the family code, which are not compliant with uh, the, disposi the, 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 the dispositions of the international treaties or, and the CEDAW as well, such as, as I said earlier, the marriage of minors, such as the authorization of polygamy, and such as inequality in, her in inheritance, which I'm addressing right now, so inheritance. Um, I, I added this actually to my talk because there are things are happening, currently happening actually in Morocco on the field of, of inheritance. So that's why I called it the current, the current challenges. Mm -hmm. So this is a big challenge. Equity between men and women in inheritance in Morocco is actually uh, debated, really, uh, as of today. 
and before it has always been considered and seen by Moroccans as some sort of taboo. It's uh, sacred, you can attach it, you cannot reform it. I mean, that, that was the mainstream idea among people. Uh, a, multi a multidisciplinary collective book on women inheritance in Morocco was released in May 2017. I brought a copy of, of from today to you, authored by several Moroccan scholars, addressing the question on the inheritance of women in Morocco and advocate, advocating a reform which would be more equitable to women. So let's see what it's about. That's just the picture of, of, of the it's not perfect one, but it gives you just this is the book. And a few days ago, I'm saying a few days ago, a petition was released online in Morocco by um, a few authors of the of the book for the repeal of the inheritance tasib rule in Morocco, creating an unprecedented debate and a massive reaction in the press and social media, both yeah. on the petition and on the idea of discussing a reform regarding inheritance in the Moroccan law. So the petition is saying, actually, it's, it's giving an argument, a major argument. According to Morocco's inheritance law, Family Code of 2004, the one that we know, men and are universal heirs, meaning they have access to the full inheritance of their parents, whereas women inherit fixed part, parts and cannot receive the totality of the inheritance without the participation of at least one male parent to divide the shares. Accordingly, so that's really uh, reasoning and common sense, you can see, women or girls who do not have a brother are required to share the inheritance of their deceased parent with the closest male relatives of the deceased, the brother of the deceased, the cousin of the deceased, the uncle of the deceased, the nephew of the deceased, etc. Or with distant male relatives, if you don't have, the, the, the deceased does not have a brother or an uncle or a nephew, it's really sometimes we reach the, 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 the most distant male relative. If inheritance by Tasif, this is the Tasif, if inheritance by Tasif was historically justified at, at some point, uh, in the tribal system of the time, where men not only took charge of their wives, but they took charge of their closest, vulnerable female relatives. But also they had the responsibility to protect them and vote for their clan. This is no longer the case. We don't have, I mean, tribal families, now it's a nuclear family with, in Morocco, father, mother, children. This is how it is. It's not a tri tribe anymore. Moroccan families today are usually limited to parents and their children. So women are often involved in taking care of the needs of their families. And this is another fact that is actually um, helping uh, the, the, the argument on repealing the tattoo. They are often in charge nowadays of their families. And the number, the current number, the actual number of household, ha households in Morocco run by, exclusively by women, is 20% of the household in Morocco are supported by a woman. Okay? So, uh, and also an increasing number of women are helping their husbands um, financially. So in addition, the number of women fending for themselves, not being supported by any male relative, Okay. They are single, they are divorced or widowed without or with children. This number has increased significantly as well. So, in the current context that I just described, the rule of Tasib as it is in the co family code nowadays is not, I mean, is consequently clearly unfair, considered to be really an unfair um, rule. The uncles do not take care of their nieces uh, anymore, usually. Of course, exceptions can happen, clearly, but I'm talking about the statistics and the main, the main history. Nor the cousins of their cousin girls. Nor do the men generally take care of the distant female relatives in their family. 
even if they are alone and poor. Therefore, how can we justify that relatives or distant relatives of a deceased person who did not leave a son come share the inheritance with the orphaned um, daughters without in any way taking neither material nor moral responsibility towards them? Why maintain in the Moroccan law a rule that not only has no longer, no longer any social justification, but also, according to the theologists and the, 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 the specialists that actually were working on this matter, it has no Quranic background. So, on the contrary, in the current context, Tasib goes against the principle of justice of the Quran, al adl and not in the sense of its purposes or mahasi. The petition has been receiving since its release on March 21st, a very positive welcome by thousands and thousands of people. 6,500 signatures so far after more than a few days I mean, from the release, and also by the Moroccan press, social media, etc. For the first time, the debate within the Moroccan society on such essential topic is officially on. So breaking the taboos, I think that some matters are still considered or seen as taboos. For example, abortion, although abortion is now also in public space and it's debated currently. Uh, there is a law that is actually being discussed and it's uh, people are really, really pushing for this debate to, to happen and to lead to a a new law, because actually abortion is banned, as you know, in many countries it's banned. In South America, I read lately that a young girl got an abortion went to prison or was prosecuted in Peru, if I recall correctly, because it is banned in those countries as well. So it's a universal question. Not it's not an Islamic matter. It's just religion in general. All religions are not, you know defending that kind of actions, but um, Moroccan is not, Morocco is not a secular country, as I said, so it's clearly a very complicated debate, and, but it is uh, now happening, actually. The law is not implemented yet. It's not voted yet. It is under discussion. So for the time being, it is banned, and the, the, the performers of, the, of this kind of action are prosecuted, as, as I mean, the criminal law is is really very severe on on abortion, and the, the new uh, project of the law is trying actually proposed to broaden the cases in which the abortion can be legal. But for the time being, it's only legal if the, the life of the baby or, or the mother are at stake. But otherwise, uh, it's forbidden. Whereas in that case, if the law is voted, it's bro it, it would broaden uh, the perimeter of the legal abortion to rape, incest, um, congenital malformation of the baby, and mental illness of the mother. So it's really it would be a a good a good change. Single mothers remain a, a problem because the law is really uh, not yet very uh, is not helping situation of these ladies. Uh, their babies are, if they're an unwanted baby, but she cannot abort, that's the, what I mentioned earlier. So that's, that creates really uh, dramatic and uncomfortable situations for these women and their children um, in a highly judgmental society. Interreligious marriages also would be, according to my, uh, you know, my opinion, Another challenge, it's a, you know, uh, according to the Moroccan law, um, Muslim Moroccan men can marry a non-Muslim woman, even if she's not, she doesn't convert to Islam. But the opposite is not true. A woman who's a Moroccan and Muslim cannot marry a non-Muslim unless he converts to Islam. So usually, the, I mean, and the number is growing, the number of Moroccan women get, getting married to non-Muslims is really because we live in a globalized world. 
the, the girls are, have access to education. They go study abroad and they travel more and they, so the, 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 the opportunity is to meet someone from another country and, and make your, you know, get married to him are higher. So the, usually they don't come back to Morocco. If the, their husband is not, does not convert to Islam, how can they settle in Morocco? It's very difficult for them because of the, they don't have any status. Their marriage is not legal. It's not even a marriage. For Morocco, they're not married. Okay? So that's uh, a problem. The self-censorship, this is not a legal issue, but I always mention it, and we talk with Farzaneh a lot about it. Self-censorship of women, is not, the law is not going to solve that problem, but it's related to mentalities. I, I, I could have put it in the slide on mentalities res resistant, but it's a fact. The numbers, I mean, the number of women who really don't apply for candidacy for higher positions and are um, because they, they, they just don't want to take the risk to have conflict in their household or with their husband, etc. So self-censorship is clearly one of the issues. Uh, marital sexual abuse, what we call viol conjugal, so it's conjugal rape, if I can translate that. The new law on violence, which I mentioned earlier, is not addressing that. And the feminist groups are not happy about it at all. So it is under debate now. It's not clearly included in this law. So, but anyway, it may happen because actually, as I said, these issues are debated currently and open. So activism is ongoing on this. It's not a taboo anymore. People are talking about and addressing the, 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 the issue of conjugal rape. So arguments to go further, how can we go further? The, the major argument is really to, to, to think and believe that we can uh, you know, make courageous reforms and still be compliant with the framework of I mean, the religious uh, background of Morocco because the constitution says that, uh, that Islam is the religion of the state. So although Islam is the religion of the state in the Moroccan constitution, this does not mean at all that Sharia is ruling all the, the, the laws in Morocco. That This is not true. Uh, in fact, the majority of laws in Morocco are based on other sources such as for instance, the French civil law, Code Napoleon, for the civil law and the contract law, etc. The customs, the jurisprudence, the doctrine, international treaties, etc. So Islamic law is not the sole, the only source of uh, laws in Morocco. For family law, it is a major source. But, um, voilà. And to go further also, this Article 19 in the Moroccan Constitution. We just need to make it happen in the, um, in the laws in Morocco, in the codes in Morocco. Equality between men and women is a constitutional principle, which is a very new uh, thing in, in Morocco. So we need to make that appear in the laws uh, in the country. We have a background now to do that. Uh, last but not the least, many scholars now and activists and political leaders speak out the argument that Islam is not an obstacle to fair reforms. That's, that's the, the, the major argument. And that mentalities and resistance and patriarchal readings of the Quran remain the main source of resistance to change and to women uh, empowerment in general and gender equality. So that's that's a quote of Professor Fatima Sadiqi, and not Mernisi, it's another Fatima, who's a professor of linguistics and gender studies uh, in Morocco, whom I respect, really, and uh, I, I, I like her work. Women are increasingly making the argument that they have been deliberately excluded from a full role in society, not because Islam prescribes it, but because Islam was revealed in a deeply patriarchal social context. So that's the, the so thank you very much. <laughs>
modest. So there's a, a, one of the leading scholars in politics and gender in the United States made her career arguing that the unsung heroes of sex equality policies across the globe are lawyers. And I don't know if everybody here knows, but Akima is one of those lawyers. So the book that she passed around and that she had in the, um, of course, in the talk, she was one of the editors of, she has a piece in that. It's really a manifesto in many ways. And she was one of the six authors, right, on the petition yeah. that's now gone global. Yeah. And, I, and many of my students ask me, because we haven't had seen that kind of activism as much mm -hmm. in the United States when it comes to uh, laws, especially mm -hmm. recently, we don't have a, a, a constitutional equality clause, right, in the United States, for okay. instance. Okay. So I, it would be great if you could talk a little bit about um, as an activist, what you know, how how you made that petition happen? You know, what kinds of work do you expect to happen moving forward? Who is going to push the levers of power to change the inheritance law in Morocco? Actually, we are hoping that this petition, after the process of signing, is is over because in a few weeks we will have a great, a, a clear idea on um, how many signatories we finally uh, have in, in this petition, uh, the, the, our purpose really and our objective is to uh, reach out to the political parties because, I mean, you know, in Morocco, uh, the, the, it is a democratic system. The political parties are powerful now. Of course, activists are a very important tool for, the, for transformation, but to implement or, or, or vote a law at the end of the day, the political parties need to really propose something. And I think, I believe, and I'm hoping also that, um, and some, some people among the first 100 signatories of this petition are linked somehow to some political parties. All kinds of political parties, not necessarily the leftists or not, not at all. It's really, the, the, in a, I read in a newspaper lately about this petition, they said something that is really, that, that pleased me profoundly. It's the, they said the, the, the strength or the strong point of this petition is the diversity of the first uh, signatories, I mean the, the first hundred, because we, we really reached out, I, I did not mention that, but the group who uh, actually created and wrote, drafted this petition, reached out to a group of the hundred, first hundred signatories, emblematic people in their own fields. So we have activists in there, we have people from um, all, all sectors actually, and some of them are affiliated somehow to, to some ideology, I mean political party. And they, they signed, and even though they are not necessarily in the same, um, come on, yeah, in the same, ideology, politically speaking, they signed the petition. So this is something that was praised uh, in, in one newspaper in particular, but others really re repeated that, uh, that, that uh, praising, and it's really a positive thing about this petition. The diversity of the people who joined and who signed. So um, I, have, I am confident that the next step would be uh, that the political <coughs> parties will really be in charge and propose uh, a new project of law, reforming <coughs> this part of the Tasib rule that I mentioned. That, that's, that's how it should happen if all goes well. Other petitions, perhaps in the past, in, on other fields, I'm talking about inheritance, many petitions are released every day online on many aspects, you know that, I mean, and they don't get so many signatories and they are less successful or more successful but they don't lead to uh, the big changes that we are hoping for but I really have I mean I know the context and the field quite well and I think knowing Morocco as I know it and as it is nowadays uh, I think this this change this reform has all the chances to take place and to become a reality in a one year, more or less one year time. That's my opinion, of course. I may, the future will tell us if I was wrong or right, but I believe that in any case, 
this is what we are expecting as activists, as scholars who are activists, that it will really now be the role of the parties and the political people to, to be in charge. Yeah. Please, I don't know, whoever, <laughs> please. Uh, thank you so much for this it's very interesting talk. Um, uh, I think it's very interesting. You mentioned at the outset that about 20% of the legislators uh, in the uh, parliament are uh, women. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you'd talk a little about the relation of that group to the petition, the current petition. Actually, we, um, frankly, the, the, the ladies in the parliament who are now, you know, representatives in parliament. We did not have, I mean, there was no uh, direct link mm -hmm. at this point between the authors of the book and the, uh, the people who wrote the petition and who took the initiative of the, the, of the petition because we did not want it to be um, a politicized petition, you know. We wanted it to come from yeah. activists. Clearly, contacts will be made, are made already, and will be made with people from political parties, etc. Uh, but for the time being, it's really an, a scholarly activist uh, initiative and movement. So no no contacts or no links yet with, with the, the, the women representatives or the women uh, ministers or anything. It was really, we, we, we thought it would, it was very important to start from the, the activists, you know. So we are scholars, but there are people who are not professors necessarily, but they are, we have doctors also in, in the group. We have people who are theologists, which is, uh, as I said yesterday, I told you that the importance of theologists in, in, in petitions like this one is, is major because the religious component is major in uh, this kind of debate and this kind of reforms. Will it be seen as a challenge to those women in the parliament? I don't, I, to take it it's, it, uh, inheritance as a, a topic, uh, subject, to, subject to a reform, is a challenge for everybody. As I said, because it was considered to be quite, you know, a taboo. You mm -hmm. don't change the law on inheritance and that's it. That's, that's what the, I think. I yeah, think but the two it's, taboo it's topics, shifting. it's inheritance law and sexual abuse of girls at home. Oh, yes. Incest. Yeah, and I think and these sense. two are the two Tabus. ultimate taboos in our part of the world. And I want to congratulate you. What a brilliant strategy. First Thank of you. all, that the reform is not coming from up down. Yeah. Because up down. you know, as you know, in Iran we had a family reform law in 1967. Mm -hmm. And the Islamic Republic of Iran, before it was ratified, we didn't even have a constitution yet. The first set of laws that were rescinded were the family laws. And the argument was that it was the lackey of the West, the Shah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So this is brilliant. Yeah, it's true. Right. The fact that it comes from the grassroots. Yeah, exactly. mm -hmm. yeah. Please. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you very much for this informative actually uh, lecture. And to us, and I'm very impressed as all of us here that the topic and the issue of inheritance is actually in the agenda, yeah. especially in Morocco. Yeah. <clears throat> now, we know that in the whole Middle East and the Arab world, only Tunisia is the only one who was able to touch on this topic. Mm -hmm. A few weeks ago, sure. there were millions of administrators, and still they struggle to really with this issue. Yeah. Now, knowing both societies, of course, there is no compa it's not comparable you know, mm -hmm. Tunisia to Morocco. Mm -hmm. We know that the history of the politics and the civil movements, feminism, so how much is really there is a possibility for the people, the masses, that it's a religious society. Of course, it okay. is quite so, you know, there is, is there like what we call a havina in, in Arabic that we mm -hmm. really be able to accept actually that, even that there is that hope it's coming, as Fazana was saying, mm -hmm. very good point. It is a reform from the bottom. Yeah. That's one point. The other one also, do you have female judges? That's my question. Yeah. And also, was were women part of the 2011 re writing of the Constitution? Absolutely. So I, I'm, I'll start with the judges. The women judges in Morocco is about 20% 20, 20 of women, uh, um, ju of judges in Morocco are women. 
um, this is not much, but it's not zero either. I mean, you know, so uh, I o often say that the, 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 the number of judges who are women is not necessarily uh, the, the guarantee of, you know, defending the interests of women, etc. I mean, facts, I was the first to be surprised that I heard and read uh, facts, I mean, from case studies in, in, in the judiciary where uh, women judges are not necessarily the best, you know, supporters to other women who are actually coming to uh, defend themselves in a family case. That's one. But 20% are women, which is, and, it, and I really believe we, we, we would need more than that because um, that, that would be a, a great, a great um, impact. I think it would have an impact on the law enforcement uh, of the Mudawana, of the family code, in favor you know, of the interest of women and their children. That's one thing. Um, your first question regarding the, the, uh, the conservative you know, um, nature or component of Moroccan society, you know, surprisingly enough, perhaps, or, or not, um, sometimes I'm, I'm not even too surprised because I know that I know conservative ladies who are actually wearing also the veil, and etc. And they are so, fe I mean, the feminism is not, uh, you know, now we, now we, we, we use the, the, the term Islamic feminist for a long time. Fabiola Mernissi was called Islamic feminist. Now we say Islamist feminist to to talk about the conservative uh, feminists in Morocco and other countries. But it's more complicated than that. Among the signatories of this petition on inheritance and on passive, uh, many are actually conservative ladies, and they sign. Because the, the rule that is actually uh, the subject matter is something that is questionable even for them, okay? They really believe and, and wrote a lot of press actually and a lot of papers were released lately and social media also talks a lot about this and blogs and people are writing and conservative people signed the petition because the, this, what we are calling for is really uh, relevant to them, to conservative people because they tell you it's not a tyrannic <coughs> rule uh, as opposed to a mother rule that is the double to share the, 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 the men, um, Muslim men have double the share, uh, double as much as their sister uh, when the, one of the parents uh, is deceased. This is another story. It's, it's complicated. Yes, it's unequal, but it's a totally different debate. And it's not at all today um, addressed. It's too early and it will be very complicated because the sacred text of Islam, I mean the Quran, is there is a verse that is clearly address, addressing this rule of the double. So, but regarding Tasib, uh, people are welcoming this idea of changing this rule because it's a patriarchal rule, an equalitarian rule. And it's not at all, I mean, it was fair perhaps in the seventh century where the people, as I said, men were in charge. So they came to share the inheritance with the daughters because they are truly in charge and they are truly supporting the, the, the females of the family. But uh, it's not the case anymore in our societies. They are not tribal anymore, they are, they are nuclear. So. That's something that is really federating conservatives and liberals, and it's not a petition for liberal for liberals or by liberals. Uh, that's very important. So that's why it's working, and, and that's why I'm quite uh, positive and confident about this because I see that people are joining, even though they are from the conservative, you know, spirit. That's, my, again, my, my reading and my opinion. Yes. Um, a little question of one about the uh, <coughs> uh, marital uh, laws. And to what extent, at least among young people, at least I would say in the larger cities, uh, 
is it possible for people to just live together without being officially married? Uh, this, and the other question is about the discourse and the language of discourse. Uh, if you could explain why the volume is published in English and not Arabic or French. Oh, it was actually. It oh. was published in Arabic and in French in May 2017. Oh, okay. And it was released in English in February 2018. So right. to give exposure to the, to, to the, the you know, the questions addressed uh, among U.S. universities and the English speaking. So Arabic, oh yes, very important. The publishing in Arabic was the first one. <laughs> and, and French and now English. So that's uh, like, I, they, people ask me, where can we find the book in the US? Um, I, I know it's not in bookstores, but I, maybe in Amazon, I think. Is it an online version of the book? Uh, PDF version or just online PDF access version? to the library? I, I will ask for you the publisher. I, I don't know. I, I don't think so, for, but I don't know. I, I need to ask. So your question. Uh, normally, uh, you cannot, I mean, in Morocco, uh, in many Islamic countries, you cannot, uh, live with somebody as, as, as a couple if you're not married. That's the book, that's the, 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 the principle. So people now clearly, you have cases of people being roommates. I mean, and nobody will bother them or tell them anything, but it's edgy because normally they are not supposed to, they are not supposed to do that. But in big cities, many students share the rent or you know, a male and, and girl and boy, and they are not together, or even if they were together, they have to be very careful and cautious because if they act as a couple, normally they, they, they are not supposed to live together unless they are married or live together, but they are not a couple. But it's very complicated to prove all this. People, so, so that's why nobody is, is prosecuted or there are no problems uh, that I know of. Uh, due to that, so many students are now uh, renting places in Casablanca or Rabat, but uh, they can have problems if they are a couple and they are not married, clearly, because this is not, uh, it's not legal to have uh, relations without without being married. Oh, but it's really illegal, it's not just that it's not so acceptable socially. No, acceptable socially, clearly. By, by many people, although in big cities people are accepting that. People are more liberal in the big cities. Yeah. But I'm talking about the law. I'm talking about the, the legal perspective again. Yeah, session about law. What, what does the law say? Uh, you cannot live, uh, you cannot have a relation with a, a person without uh, outside the framework of marriage. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, that's how it is. Yeah, you were first, I think. Okay. Then I okay. um, actually, a terrific talk. And you've been mentioning various statistics of 20. So <laughs> let me add two more and then ask a question about them. You mentioned that there was about 20% women in the labor force, and also that about 20% of women had obligations to support a household. Uh, and presumably, it's not 100% of the women who are working, who are you know, supporting a household. So there is some overlap there. But um, you were talking also about violence against women. And the research on that shows that where women have consolidated economic power, they're much less likely to be beaten. Yeah. Conversely, where they do not, the strongest factor of, in a study of 90 societies uh, of, you know, of linked to domestic violence was women's economic dependency. Yeah. So I'm wondering to what extent, two things, the formal labor force participation is going up, and also the informal labor force participation, perhaps through microcredit programs of various NGOs, et cetera, are going up. And if this is having um, so any sort of an impact, because the <coughs> possibility where it could go wrong is that the man will grab the money and beat her up anyway. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was just wondering if you could comment on econo economic empowerment mm -hmm. um, and how that is working, because that's another way of getting around the violence against women. Clearly, the, this this uh, trend that you're mentioning exists in Morocco as well. The more economically emancipated women are, usually they know how to prevent, you know, the situation of violence at home. Usually, but again, uh, from what I hear in the cases that we, you know, that we, we see um, on, on the, from the field, from the grassroots, you have cases of violence, although. Uh, women are not 
explain the precarity situation and they are actually working and in urban areas and violence is there also. Especially in the transition period. That, that has happened in all, almost all yeah. countries. But in the transition period, it goes up. It yeah. goes up. But the thing is, now with the, the new, I mean, the, the new Mugawana, the new family code of 2004, and women getting new access to the proceed to initiate the proceedings of divorce, many women who are <coughs> victims of violence mm -hmm. at home with their husbands, use that if they are working, mm -hmm. if they're economically independent, they can use that new right that they have, asking for divorce. But that the, the, the situation of mentalities as it is in Morocco uh, is still, um, how can I say that? It's really complicated because, and complex, it is complex, because some women um, do not want to be a divorcee, mm -hmm. do not want to, the status of unmarried or a even worse, worse for them, divorcee. This status is something that is for them, for some women, I'm not saying all women, mm -hmm. I'm not, uh, I think this is shifting as well and ch things are changing, uh, especially among the, the, the generation of young women, you know, young girls who are much more emancipated than their mothers or grandmothers. But some women really perceive divorce as a violence itself. It's that the status changes, the, 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 the perception of society toward her mm -hmm. in her new status uh, is totally shifting. And sometimes it creates, really generates a lot of suffering for these women. So they just stay at home. And, and I mentioned, I think, in the study that uh, was made with UN Women in 2016, the survey speaks for that. I think I, I mentioned the number. Uh, it was more than half of the interviewed women said, I think, um, they, that they could tolerate violence if it's the, pr the price to pay to maintain the family united. So this is a mentality thing. Right. It's more, for them, it's a bigger violence, perhaps, to just uh, make the family explode. And, 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 and shatter. But so that's, that's so, it's really a personal as specific to each woman, but you have yeah. to, but emancip economic emancipation clearly uh, brings uh, uh, protection to, to women against violence. Is it rising though? Is the economic emancipation rising both in formal labor force it's, and informally through in micro Morocco, There is a big issue on informal work in general. And uh, as I said in, in this talk uh, earlier, the, it's very difficult for women. The numbers are, are terrible. Yeah. Uh, women out of the, who do not have income, mm -hmm. I mean, the number is so high. Eight out of 10 is a lot. Yeah. It's a lot. It's more than the majority, it's huge. So that's not the trend. I don't see the trend really, it's not multiplying, it's not mm -hmm. exponential. If that's your question, it's yeah. quite not. And, and it's not good. Yeah. That's something that uh, really needs to be to be improved. Yeah, um, you had talked about um, the lack of women who have been informed about the changes. For example, like in the two thousand and four laws, are you are you seeing groups that are kind of um, launching campaigns to create that forums for education so that women know about? Uh, yeah, a, yeah, a lot is being done in that uh, regard, and. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that today, as of today in Morocco, uh, women are not at all aware of their rights. I think that people, we interviewed some women, I mean, this is some field work that we do sometimes, yeah. and it's very interesting because the ones that really are not so aware of what is happening tell you that, yes, we heard, we heard that, yes, it, it, we heard that, uh, there is something new for us, but we are not sure exactly. I mean, they don't know the content, legally mm -hmm. speaking, I mean, the law, they, they, don't, they are not uh, acquainted to, you know, the, the legal framework, etc. But they <coughs> know that something is happening and that is uh, in favor of their interests. Uh -huh. So they are, there is awareness now, more than 10 years ago, clearly. And lots of campaigns and, and actions are made by uh, NGOs, women NGOs, again, I come back to the fem 
feminist movements there. I mean, activism has been really expanding since the 80s in Morocco in such a way that um, even internationally and the international organizations are uh, praising that and they are out there really in every field, politicized or not politicized, not necessarily, not, it's not always, everything's not always about politics. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's, they are, it's more about social now, uh, more than ever, the social uh, equilibrium balance in, in the country because we have in Morocco social issues clearly of, and social uh, inequalities, etc., unemployment, so social issues mainly. Um, so yes, uh, I, I really, um, I really, um, I'm happy. I'm, I'm confident about this raising awareness uh, aspect is really working and okay. ongoing. And from the public, also from the officials, the ministry, etc., in charge of family, they have their own strategies and campaigns, etc., all these kind of things. But the NGOs and the, 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 the associations, I mean, what we call associations, it's NGOs, activists, mm -hmm. grassroots are really, really out there for us. And even television, because Moroccans watch um, TV is present more than ever in households. So uh, TV is also participating to, to that kind of effort. Yeah, so um, let's say like everything, so I guess think about long run wise, that let's say everything works out, vision goes out, mm -hmm. inheritance goes well, all the other things we're talking about all fantastic and all. Mm -hmm. uh, so short run wise, it might be everything goes all well, everything fair to the women and to the society, but so now you're talking specifically uh, Morocco. Let's say now for the long run, how will how, how do you think it will work out? Do you think it will always still be strong like this? As in, like, what, how does other Arab society think about it? Would it, would it be like, as you know, Arab society now, when the hate change, so uh, would they be in the favor of it or would they be completely against it? So as in, like, the Morocco society itself now, would you think it will be fine as everything will work out? Or do you think it will... You know uh, that change is, uh, is, is you just said, uh, societies who hate uh, hate change. That's right. You said that. It's actually change scares people, and I really believe that a scared person, and you know that, and you see that in your own societies, and you see it in Europe, and the way people when they are scared of the unknown, scared of what they don't know, what they don't master, they close up and they just isolate themselves and reject, and the reaction of the Rejection is a form of violence, and violence starts there, where where, where you, you start closing because you're scared. So the idea of to, to, to make these changes, which are taking place, however, despite of all the resistance and all the people who are really rejecting, not because they're against women, but because, because they are scared of all the changes that are going, according to their feelings, too fast. It's going too fast. Some people tell you on the streets in Morocco, oh my God, it's going too fast, uh, this is too much, so slow down, we, we should be careful, what if this is not good for our societies and families, etc., etc. So uh, to, to give more rights to women has always been something that in every society, throughout the history of Europe also and other places in the world, to give this, this more rights to women means free, freedom and liberate them, emancipate them. And it scares some people who think that a free, emancipated, self-confident person, lady, woman, uh, could, be, could do anything, could leave her family and her husband because she feels autonomous and she just don't, doesn't want to stay, uh, you know, in, in this marriage. She, she would perhaps be, a, a, you know, I don't know. People imagine all sorts of things because they're scared. So this is not uh, actually uh, stopping the process. The process is huge and people, as we said, it's, it's, it's a bottom-up thing. The, the changes that are currently happening come from the people. So these people who, part of them is a scared community. For people who are, okay, what will happen next? This is going too fast. It will, I think that it's a balance 
and it's not easy. I'm not saying it's easy. The Arab world is a complex uh, world nowadays with many problems and radicalization problems and extremist extremist issues, etc. But people want want equality and want equity, want equitable uh, situation for their daughters. Men signed the petition that we talked about earlier. Many men. It's not a, a story of women. A feminist is not necessarily a woman. Thank God. <laughs> and it's men also. And men have daughters and think about their daughters and think about the interests of their daughters. So it's just it, what, the, the day that people start thinking about common interest. Uh, the, the, the feeling of, 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 of anxiety and stress and feeling st <coughs> scared will vanish slowly. It's a question really of, uh, of uh, uh, feeling confident about what is happening. So I, I don't think uh, this, is, uh, this can constitute um, an obstacle or something to the, to the process. The, the process comes from the people themselves anyway. You know, if it was a top-down thing, I may tell you a different thing. But in, in that case, it's not. Uh, yeah. yeah, sorry. Okay. Can you maybe touch on what the feminist movements in Morocco are doing for lesbian women or other LGBTQ people? Uh, in Morocco, of course, we have many visuals uh, and, and lesbians are, are out there, but there is no, it's still um, I would say, I did not mention it, I could have mentioned it actually as a taboo, because it is still seen as something that is not, it's, it's too early to address that, etc. However, there are movements, one movement in particular was that appeared a few years ago, and they even made a, a small demonstration, but they had issues, I mean, they, they, they have problems with, everyone is looking at them in a very uh, judgmental way, and it, people are clearly, the grassroots are, never uh, ready in conservative countries for that kind of things, of course. But they are there. I mean, Moroccans are like everywhere. This is just a normality uh, among the population, people who are uh, different from the, the, the normal, so-called normal trend. But it's not, no, it's not in the agenda. I mean, the priorities are elsewhere, clearly. But they're out there and they're on social media and they try to also integrate this cause among the human rights global you know discussion so things will i'm sure it's part of the aspects that clearly are pending and will be taking place in due time I'm sure. um so i wanted to ask about if you've spoken to or interviewed any women or men who are against the movement and what would their meaning be against what against the against movement, the movement. The like movement of who, reforming the laws, yeah. will you speak yeah. about that? Yes. Actually, some people are, of course, are against. Well, they, but the, the reason is they think, and even among students that I meet in the law school, they, some of them don't know. And when you, you don't know exactly, you just have this belief because you grew up hearing people say, uh, saying inheritance is just, it comes from, uh, you know, it com comes from Quran, everything comes from Therefore, you just cannot question it. So, when when you the theologist wrote and and said and are really uh, giving the argument that they, they as theologists are telling you that tasib that the, the, the point, specific point I, I address now huh, in this talk they, they they tell you that you you see things differently and you start understanding that okay. It's questionable, and it's not Quranic necessarily, and it comes from the hand of humans and not the hand of God, you know. But we people in the Arab and Muslim Islamic world really believe that every single rule uh, relating to inheritance uh, do come from uh, the Quranic background exclusively, which is more complex than that. It's not this. It's much more complex than that. So people who are against, when they tell you yes, because it's Quranic and you cannot question it, and then you tell them, perhaps it's not <coughs> because this rule is not a Quranic rule, it comes from several other sources, then the person 
starts to open up because they feel more, <coughs> you know, uh, confident. They don't, they didn't know actually. So the, usually the resistance and being against comes from that, comes from thinking that, uh, wrongfully thinking that uh, it's the, the word of God. And it's not, it's not, it's more complex than that. Just quick question. Thank you first for the talk. Uh, I know I'm from Lebanon, and I know in Lebanon there was some few demonstrations lately, last year and so, about women not being able to give citizenship. Mm -hmm. Lebanese women cannot give citizenship if they're married. married uh, uh, Non-Lebanese, really? Yeah, right. Uh, oh, okay. Only men can give okay. citizenship to their mm -hmm. kids, but women, uh, so it comes from the father's mm -hmm. side. What is the situation in Morocco? So in Morocco, since 2004, now they can give the citizen, a Moroccan woman who, who marries a non-Moroccan uh, um, man, can give her citizenship as <coughs> Moroccan to her children with this man. But there is a huge, of course, condition that you can, I mentioned that earlier, it's the religion of mm. the husband. So they have if to he's be... a Muslim, then she can do that. If she married a, a, a non-Muslim who, who did not convert to Islam, um, first of all, there is no marriage. I mean, for Moroccan law, there is no marriage. They, did, they are not married people, according to Moroccan law. They got married, for instance, in France, in some city hall or something, or elsewhere, à la mairie, or elsewhere, in, in a foreign country, the country of the husband, let's say, and, and she wants to give the citizenship to her children with this man. It's not working. Because the first question that you will get from Moroccan authorities is, uh, where is the marriage contract, uh, the Moroccan law, you know, marriage contract? They have none. And is your husband uh, a, a Muslim? Although a foreigner, but a Muslim? The answer is obviously no. Then it cannot happen. So the, the change happened in Morocco in 2004 only for marriages uh, between Moroccan uh, women and uh, foreign men who are Muslim. And that's, I think, the only country in the Arab world, no? Um, I can't I think... think uh, Tunisia, I, Tunisia I think, is the same. yes, Tunisia clearly has started a big, big uh, effort of reforms, very daring in the 50s uh, with Bourguiba. It was a top-down thing rather than bottom-up. That was what we discussed yeah, yesterday. This is totally different. So, well, perhaps we could have one more question. And yeah, we'll, there were two, I we'll, saw I'll two of them here. Oh, I just kind of follow up. So does it work both mm -hmm. ways? Like, if a Muslim man in Morocco marries a non-Muslim woman, would they be considered married if it's the man? No, no, it's, it? it's, it's, it's working differently according uh, whether it, it, it's a, more, uh, a, a man or, or a woman. Uh, a Moroccan man, a Muslim Moroccan man can marry a non-Muslim woman and she is not uh, if she's she comes from the three religions of the book okay, to, to be really precise so that means um, Christian Jewish or Muslim um, and she's not supposed to convert to Islam or anything she can be Christian or she can be however an inheritance uh, the inheritance law uh, does not allow a non-Muslim to inherit from a Muslim, so okay, they have they would have issues in inheritance, you know. But the opposite, the Moroccan Muslim woman cannot marry a non-Muslim man according to Moroccan law if he does not uh, convert to Islam. See, so it's not the same for men and women. That's why it's it's again something that is not equal. Clearly. Yes, please. Ah, sorry. Uh, thank you so much for this fascinating topic. Very informative. Uh, my question, not a question, but a comment. I'm just curious. Of, you mentioned some resources of the law, like Quran, defense mm -hmm. law. And I'm like interested in whether you or, or other people have really investigated all the sources of the law. Because it seems that in our Arab societies, there is a common saying, says in Arabic, Al Maruf Arban Kal Mashru Sharaan. Like mm -hmm. the customs. tribes exactly the tribal customs are strongly and strictly yeah. enforced as if they are a Quran. Yeah, yeah. And it seems to me that most of the law is not really based on the Quran as you said. Yeah, it's basically uh, mostly based on the 
tribal like uh, customs or tribal system which do not really make any sense and they are really opposing the sense of equality between yeah. gender so my point is whether there are parts of the law that are strictly based on quran and whether they are in favor of like for women like whether women find them like in favor of them mm -hmm. and versus the other like uh, laws and that are based on other resources for example actually no, the system persecution in Morocco is really clear on, on the, you know, the, the legal system uh, that is in force in Morocco. There is a constitution and the texts that are voted, that become laws, are voted in the parliament. And it's a, what we call droit positive, positive law, you could say that. So that means it's really, this is the, the, the background, the main uh, background, legal background in the country. You, it all comes back to that. In family law, truly, uh, the end of the family code, there is, I think it's Article 400, if I'm not, uh, I, I'm sure it is actually the one, that says, uh, in case uh, of um, doubt or, or hesitation in the interpretation of some of the articles of the family code, you come back to the uh, Islamic law, the Maliki Sunni Islamic uh, school of thought, clearly. So in the case of family law, the source clearly is, uh, is, is uh, religious, which is why things are uh, clearly more complex and more complicated to change. And any reform that touches family law in Morocco really needs a huge consensus, a huge debate, because uh, you need to, to involve theologists, you need to involve ulama, you know, the, 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 the theologists actually, we call them ulama. You need to involve lawyers, you need to involve every, every uh, a part of the society to, to, to discuss the matter. So in, for the, the, the case of Tasib inheritance, clearly um, there will be a debate. And in the parliament, the day the project, I mean, the, the, the the proposal becomes a project of law, perhaps, let's hope, and is discussed within the parliament, it will be, I anticipate, uh, a big, big debate. And it's, it's, it, this is what, I mean, this is democracy. The political parties are represented within the parliament and they will start, you know, the, it's, it's a democratic fight, battle. And uh, we'll see then the voters, what will happen, how many voters will Will, will vote or not at the end of the day for that kind of reform. Let's see. But really, it's Morocco is is not based on Sharia. You know, it's not that. Some, it's very important that it's, it's Sharia is because the Sharia has taken as a whole is a it's another system. It's really the Quran and the Hadith are themselves considered as legal or uh, regulatory cor corpuses which is not the case for, yeah. Yeah, I'm done. Thank you so much. <laughs>